Welcome to the Pounder Podcast. I'm Katie. And I'm Melissa. And we're your hosts. Today we're going to be talking to Miss Hash about crime scene protocol in the John Benet Ramsey case. Miss Hash used the John Benet Ramsey case in her forensics class to discuss this topic. So we're here with Miss Hash, who is our forensics teacher here at Central. Hi! And, and we're going to talk about forensics crime scenes and a certain case that we have that goes along with that. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Crime Scenes. And I think today we're talking about John Benet Ramsey. That's what you all agreed on? Yep. All yes. right. So for those of you who don't know, John Benet Ramsey was a child beauty queen back in the 90s. And we don't know her actual day of death. It was either Christmas night or early the next morning. Um, but she was killed in her home. And uh, the crime scene procedures were not followed at all. And that's kind of what we're going to go into today. What are some of the basic crime scenes? So any crime scene, whenever somebody calls 911, the first thing that's going to happen is the dispatcher is usually going to ask if there's still a danger um, at the crime scene. So let's say you find a body and call 911 and... Um, you know, most people are going to say, I don't know, you know, I don't know if the danger is still here or whatnot. So the police are going to be sent to um, a crime scene and sometimes additional emergency responders, um, such as a paramedic or something like that. And in this case, because it was Christmas, uh, because it was in an affluent area with not a lot of usual crime, only one police officer went out to the crime scene. Um, so normally that's not that big of a deal, except you've got a mansion, one police officer can't secure everything. And so what ended up happening is the police officer couldn't secure the entire home or neighborhood of the crime scene, didn't kind of contain the whole family into one area, they didn't call for backup, the, they didn't call for help from other agencies or detectives or investigators. Um, there was just a lot of things that went wrong. Yeah. I do believe it was Boulder, Colorado. Yep. Other woke up the morning and had found that JonBenet wasn't in her bed. So that's when the police were called. And I think that she ended up actually calling some of her friends over to the house. That's correct. She did call people to the house. Um, she found a ransom note. So that's actually, the ransom note is actually what tipped her off that something was wrong because she claimed she found the ransom note when she came downstairs and it was allegedly on the stairs. So she calls the police and then in true drama fashion, she calls all her friends and people start coming over while the police officer is there still trying to conduct the in initial investigation of where were you, what happened, um, before all the investigators could even get there. So now we have a ransom note, we have a potential kidnapping crime scene, and we have all of Patsy's friends and neighbors coming over. And all their fingerprints. And all, all their the evidence. fingerprints. Contaminating yes. the evidence. Yep. So, if you were going to be an attorney, either a prosecutor or a defense attorney for a suspect, this whole case is blown apart right away because all these friends came over and they are all messing with every bit of physical evidence and there is. of course, is. passing around the ransom note. Yep, passing Doesn't around. Help. Absolutely. So, it leads us into when they actually found JonBenet. She had been in the basement. And I believe that the police officer had said that they were going to search from top to bottom, but then the dad went straight to the basement, and he found her, and he picked her up. Yep. Which right there is just a big problem, because yeah. you want to leave it how it is, because everything is a clue. Yeah, so um, my understanding at that point, um, it's getting close to, you know, in the early afternoon hours. So now, you know, they have all their friends still at the house. They're still thinking that this is just a missing persons case. 
and um, detectives are now finally there and involved along with the original police officer. And they're like, all right, Mr. Ramsey and one of his friends, you guys go search the house, go start top to bottom. Let's see what we find and see if you notice anything out of place, which is actually asking a victim to look and see if anything's out of place isn't unusual because you might not notice things initially until you walk past 20 times and you're like, wait, wait a minute, that cabinet door is open, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, they actually start their search in the basement and uh, now keep in mind, this is a huge house and um, lo and behold, there she was, which at this point, it, and I can't remember right now exactly what time the 911 call was, but I do know allegedly the dad found her at, at around one in the afternoon. So you're looking at probably five, six, almost seven hours into the investigation. And the first responding police officer didn't look in the basement. You know, he didn't. It's the most obvious place for and any, especially anyone. especially considering that the first, like, 24, 48 hours, especially when it comes to child abduction, is the most vital. The most crucial, yes. Because with children, because so many people look for them, the abductors are known to get rid of them faster. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. So, um, going back to finding John Bonet's body, uh, witnesses reported that, you know, he was distraught, which makes sense. He just found his daughter's body. Yes, you have your daughter's body, and so instantly... As a parent, you go from, my kid is missing, somebody has my kid, I believe this because of the ransom note, to there's my baby, you know. So, dad was distraught and automatically touched the body, crying, um, put a blanket over the top of her, which that's an indication of, you know, somebody cares for the deceased, usually when they cover them up. Um, and it's a comfort, you know, kind of blocking the, the site in between the, you know, the two relatives or whatnot. But, um, in a crime scene, that's a no, no, because that blanket, you're, you've got so many other little bits and pieces of DNA from dad to daughter just being transferred through you know, the blanket through holding her hand, through unwrapping, you know, her wrists or anything like that. Um, I believe her mouth was covered with duct tape. And Can you tear that off? Yeah, yeah. Um, been... He picked up the body, took her all the way upstairs. He moved the body before investigators could photograph in detail. And uh, that's one thing about crime scenes now Everything has to be measured and photographed, and um, a lot of police departments have technology now where they can do 360 photographs of the entire crime scene and then reproject that crime scene into a blank wall when they need to revisit later. Um, but because he moved the body, you know, that evidence is completely gone. Everything that was going on there shouldn't have a police officer or a detective or somebody been with them while they were searching the house. Because if they did find anything, like they it did, need to they should contained. have been there to... Yeah. Um, ideally, yes. Ideally, um, they would have had someone walking through the entire house with them. Ideally, the dad's friend would not been of, would not have been with him. Um, there are so many things that ideally should have happened that uh, turned this case into a whole what not to do and how not to secure a crime scene. So ideally, yes, police should have been with the dad. I feel like there are so many factors that come into why this case is still unsolved. Mm -hmm. And it was 96 when this happened. Mm -hmm. So it's been about 25 years, a little yeah. over 25 years, and there's still no closure to the case. Yep, and we will honestly probably never get closure, even with the leaps and bounds our technology um, advances have you know gone through, we'll still never 
know everything just because of the mishandling of all the initial crime scene things with the fingerprints on the ransom note, um, dad touching the body, dad moving the duct tape, um, dad untying the nylon cord around her hands and um, she had cording around her neck as well. You know, picking up the body, displaying it under the Christmas tree while their friends are there. That's where he laid the body, allegedly. That's creepy. Isn't it, though? Um, maybe, you know, if we ever find a dead body, let's not touch it unless we're, you know, professional investigators. And um, even if we know the person, don't touch the body, y'all. Wouldn't the body have started to go into rigor mortis, too? Good question. Yes, the body would have started to go into rigor mortis, and that's one thing um, the medical examiners and private investigators all argued about is her time of death, which is why if you just do a basic Google search and pull up the Wikipedia page, her date of death is a range from Christmas night to the next morning because we can't pinpoint 100 percent now because she's a smaller human you know if you know anything from forensic science class rigor mortis sets in in a window of time and there's so many factors that influence that such as body weight muscle mass um height temperature and you know she's in a basement i would imagine the basement was cooler than the rest of the house that's going to delay rigor mortis a little bit and the window was broken. And the window was broken, so that changes temperature. Um, Christmas in Boulder, it's a little bit chilly. So, um, you know, as far as the autopsy goes and rigor mortis, um, one of the things they did have to do was determine um, time of death somewhat based on stomach contents. You know, um, stomach contents pass through your body in a certain amount of time depending on what you ate and she had eaten pineapples a couple hours before her death and um, based on where the pineapples were in her digestive system they had to go with that window of when she died and how long she had been there so speaking of the pineapple there's a very well-known theory and you're a big fan of this theory so why don't you explain the theory so Basically, there's this theory that John Bonet just happened to be hungry, and so she went down into the kitchen to get some pineapple. Was it was it the brother's pineapple? Or... So that's um, we're, nobody's sure whose pineapple it was, but there was a bowl of pineapple on the counter that was dusted for fingerprints, the spoon, the bowl, everything, and it had. The brother, the mother, and John Bonet's fingerprints on it. It is possible that John Bonet's brother got angry when she took the pineapple, and thus he took matters. He was on. Yeah, hands. he reacted poorly and lashed out over pineapples, and and that's actually a really plausible theory. Um, if you know anything about kids, kids react super intensely to some of the most and if there happens things. to be just like a weapon around mm -hmm. then and because John Bonet was so into the beauty pageants and she had all her parents attention he could be could have been jealous of her too and he was finally like I was my pineapple and he broke mm-hmm like you're always getting all the attention you're always getting all the um presents you're always getting all the cool clothes you're always getting everything and now you've got my pineapple and that was just the last straw that was the last straw and he lashed out which that sort of thing happens with kids all the time brothers and sisters fight all the time that's normal so nobody's blaming him here um it's probably just a normal thing but one thought um was john benet it's discussed that her body had taser marks on her neck and there were a couple different investigators, both with the police departments, uh, or the Boulder Police Department, I should say, and a private investigator, um, who or a private medical examiner, who said that the red marks found on her neck matched that of a certain taser. And um, the taser 
It's uh, called an air taser, certain model. Um, a representative from that company provided this investigator with that specific model so he could see if the, the scar marks would match up. And the jolt from that taser would be enough to knock a little six-year-old out or do more depending on if the brother just, you know, went nine-year-old bonkers, which, you know, we all know kids and we've all seen a kid who has just had enough and they go bonkers over something silly. And, you know, it would be very easy for him to take a taser and hold it to his sister's neck and hold it there for an extended amount of time and do some serious damage. Um, and at the time, there was not a lot of um, research yet on how tasers affected people, um, specifically six-year-old girls, because most people don't tase six-year-old girls. Uh, and then knowing that, um, the rest of the theory goes on that one of the parents might have helped cover it up. I've always favored the theory that the mom covered it up. First, because of so many things, like there was a nylon cord wrapped around her neck, but it was used, there was a paintbrush used for leverage, which just kind of leads to them not being strong enough to do it on their own, which just makes you also think the nine-year-old brother. Um, but the mother was the one who called the cops. She was the one who called the friends. She was the one who found the ransom note, which it can be said under analysis that the mother could have wrote the note. And once again, the bowl did have the mother's fingerprints on it. But that could be due to a variety of reasons. But it just always seemed to me that the mother could have covered it up. And then of course with the ransom note, the pad came from inside the house that it was written on, which obviously is suspicious. And the amount of money it was asking for is the exact money that the father had gotten for a Christmas bonus. So. Which is just kind of weird. Why would somebody know that? And they say that there was a broken window, as we mentioned before, in the basement. But it could have been broken beforehand. Mm -hmm. And if the mother had known the window was broken, they could have put her body down there for that reason alone. And then the duct tape, they actually found fibers of the mother's coat or something mm -hmm. under the duct tape. So there are many like theories about it. It is, of course, also complicated because she was a beauty, like, she was in the beauty pageant world. So she had a lot of, like, suspicious people on her block, which also could have um, done something. I'm pretty sure the parents never split up afterward. Um, you know, I don't remember if they split up or not. Um, I know Patsy Ramsey has since died. Um, so any yeah. knowledge she had is gone with her and John Ramsey has uh, remarried again Patsy was actually his second wife um, and so he has a new wife now and well not new at this point but um, he has since moved on and you know I I feel for the family either way yeah either way but it's most likely that when something like this happens to a child the parents blame each other they don't get closer they get further apart mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem to be happening with them i'm not sure you know let's look that up just to make sure let's see ramsey she died in 2006 she did die um with her husband by her side and she is buried next to John Bonet. Yep. So they did stick together. And, you know, one thing about, you know, parents and grief um, and how they work through things, different people do handle it differently. A lot of times, whenever a tragedy happens, you do see parents grow apart. But there are the cases where you see they pull together and they lean on each other and they're each other's rock and maybe that happened in this case um and you know maybe they really didn't have anything to do with it and this is all some crazy bonkers crime that uh you know has no explanation for why patsy's paintbrush was used to help strangle john benet with the nylon cord or 
why her notepad was used with her um some handwriting characteristics of hers and you know i mean there's who knows uh, maybe they weren't working as a team maybe this is really a crazy unsolvable crime and they leaned on each other until the very end the parents did after the investigation had started they kind of became defensive mm -hmm. because the police and journalists and people in general were suspicious of their son which I get being defensive, but they actually um, refused to cooperate with the police's investigation mm -hmm. after a couple of days. And they actually moved, they left mm -hmm. the state altogether. Not only did they leave the state altogether um, and not cooperate with the police, when they did start talking to the police, um, they did it through the media. So, you know, the police are waiting to interview the Ramseys, and then lo and behold, Here's the Ramseys on TV talking to the media about it before they're talking to the police during an active investigation. And that really slows things down um, when your main witness won't cooperate. So that's definitely an odd um, thing to do during an investigation. I know that the brother had never done an interview. He's done one interview. The and, Dr. Phil interview. Which, if you ever watch it, I personally believe he's a little creepy. Well, okay, so let's talk about the creep factor of uh, childhood trauma. Um, you have something major like that happen. First of all, you have a little sister who regionally in the beauty pageant world is famous, which we could do a whole nother podcast on the beauty pageant world. Oh. But um, you've got a mother who dresses the little sister up like she's her very own personal baby Barbie doll for these beauty pageants, and she's getting all kinds of attention. You have a dad who works and works hard nonstop. There's not much left, atten not much attention left. Um, so there's that lack of attention. Then you've got major death, like horrible death, not just illness or car accident or a quote-unquote normal death. You've got... The, Explainable death. Yes, like you've natural. got something completely bizarre and bonkers that doesn't happen to anybody that thrusts the family into national and almost international news spotlight. You're going to have a little bit of a lasting... Um, and then, of course, trauma. a lot of people who think he did it and accusing him of basically murdering his little sister. Right. So now you have to grow up with dead sister. Um, your name is, like, completely known. Your name, Yeah, her name is known, and now his name is known, and now his actions that night are forever called into question. And um, then you were only nine. So it's and like, you're only nine. Nine-year-olds don't make good decisions. That's why they can't vote or drive cars yet, you know? So, um, even if he did use a taser on her over pineapples, um, he was nine. Can nine-year-olds really be held accountable for the rest of their life? I don't... I would say no, because, like, even in our court systems, minors are treated differently. If a minor murders somebody... Most of the time, they're put in jail until they turn 18, and then they're released mm -hmm. back into society. Yeah, depending on the situation. And even in those cases, a lot of times, um, the rest of society isn't going to know what they did because juvenile records are they're, private. They're sealed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just felt that I was a little creepy because he was, like, smiling, overly smiling. But that could have been, too. You have know? Been he was on Dr. Phil. That seems a little stressful situation. Yeah, yeah. Might have the nervous smile going, which, you know, at the time of the interview, he was, what, in his young 20s during yeah, the interview? And, um... So it was about how many years after the incident? I think the Dr. Phil interview, that was 20 years after the incident. So he may have been getting close to 30 at that point. But regardless, he's lived a pretty secluded life. Um, away from the limelight, uh, I might be a little bit nervous, too, to all of a sudden be like, boom, Dr. Phil, here it is. 
I do wonder why he did it after so many years. Because at that point, I feel like I would just, I guess, move on. Because all it does is bring the spotlight back onto him. And Absolutely. he's trying. He's probably tried his whole life just to live a normal life. Unless he finally wants that spotlight that John Monet had. Oh, hadn't thought about that. Yeah. That's just, yeah, I don't know. But this whole situation is bizarre. And we are looking at it through the eyes of normal people. You know, with everyday lives. We aren't in the wealthy, elite, bolder crowd. We aren't in the beauty pageant crowd. We are just your regular, everyday people getting up, going to work and school, and living our lives. And they did not have our normal lives. And everyone can have their theories and everything, but it'd be hard to tell if the brother would actually do it. I feel like you would need to see how did the brother and sister interact Mm-hmm. before this happened well and not just that but you know it's been almost 25 years now a lot of time has passed um in the memories and you know i can remember um when i was nine years old my big brother and i fought constantly constantly there's been a lot of years between the time we fought to now now he is one of my best friends so the things we fought about back then, I don't even remember. So his memory of their interactions, even back then, you get a lot of time erasing those bad memories. Yeah. And then trauma affects your like mind as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Trauma does affect witness memory and recollection. And he probably has heard all these stories and everything, mm-hmm. and he starts to believe people have told him in the, instead of what is actually in his memory. Mm-hmm. Projection memories. Whenever you try to convince someone of what really happened based on your version of events, your perspective is different from the other person. So that's why witness testimony isn't always reliable evidence. I think this is a great case to talk about forensics because not only do you have the crime scene, you have the handwriting analysis Mm -hmm. and DNA is even a part of it. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many things that go into it. It's like an all-around case with forensics, and it wasn't even handled properly. No, nope, If it was, was handled properly, they probably would have solved the case. If it had been handled properly, they might have solved the case. Um, but, I mean, this is an excellent example of what not to do to secure a crime scene and what not to do um, for interviewing witnesses, what not to do for um, handling the evidence, what not to do for so many different assets or aspects of uh, forensic investigation. Well, I think that's all we have. So thank you for doing this with us. All right. Thanks for coming in and asking my thoughts. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to come back for the next episode. That's it for this episode of... The Pounder Pounder Podcast. Podcast.